How would you like to increase the fertility in your garden for little or no cost? I'm Kylene and I'm Jonathan and today we're standing in front of a pile of compost here that we bought at a charity auction now we paid two hundred and sixty five dollars for ten yards which is a really good deal but you can do better you can do a lot better in fact you can do it almost for free using repurposed leaves and in today's video we want to reintroduce you to Tom Bartels now we actually purchased Tom's online class maybe three years ago. Yeah. He uses yeah. bio-intensive gardening methods, which are absolutely fantastic. In fact, if you click the card in the corner, I will put a link, and I'll put it in the description of the video too, um, to a post that he has written for us all about bio-intensive gardening, but it's all organic, sustainable gardening methods that help you grow your victory garden and be incredibly successful. Let's take a look at Tom's video on how you can take ordinary leaves from ordinary trees and turn it into <laughs> gold that makes your plants grow like crazy. Hey, Tom Bartels from growfoodwell.com where I teach people how to grow nutrient-dense food in small spaces with less work. And today I'll be talking about one of the best free materials you can possibly use to grow food at home and that's leaves. I'll also be talking about the three main beneficial ways to use those leaves in terms of leaf mulch, leaf compost, and leaf mold, and how using creative ways to store them can supply you with fertility in a passive form. And what I've got behind me is what I call my passive stored fertility. And this is the total of over 25 trucks full of leaves that was dumped here last fall and handled in such a way where it went from a six foot tall pile down to its present form at about two feet off the ground. So there's been a fair amount of compression and decomposition in this leaf pile. There's three different piles here. The one over on this side is shredded leaves, which uh, decompose a lot faster. And if you can get them or shred them yourself, shredded leaves are the best way to go because they have less matting and they'll break down a lot faster. These other two were just whole leaves and I handled them much the same way when I set the piles last fall, but they're going to be on a different timeline. So let's talk about what's going on with these leaves. So this pile of leaves, actually all three of these, I had delivered last fall, about nine months ago. And it was about 25 truckloads that happened over time. And I have an agreement with the local arborist. Now I'd like to break right here for a quick statistic. Eight million tons of leaves went to landfills in 2005. Let me repeat that. Eight million tons of leaves were put in landfills in the United States alone in 2005. I think that's kind of insane. Leaves have twice the mineral content of manure by weight. They also have lots of other properties that help condition soil to create the best growing environment you can make for food. So we have to turn that around and use this valuable resource. And what's really nice for you home growers is it comes to you for free, typically. And the people that are having to dump it will thank you for letting them deliver it to you. In my case, I think we're doing a really good service to keep this out of the landfills. I'm putting it to good use. And when you learn the same methods, you can do so at your home and you can help grow more food more easily. Now, before I get into this, I just wanted to remind you, the reason I do stuff like this is to help close the loop on materials I'm using to grow food. So I increase my self-reliance, reduce my reliance on outside purchased amendments and soil conditioners and fertility um, by just doing it myself. You'll notice that the green leaves when you start are gonna have higher nitrogen. And it's important to start the pile right away. Once they're delivered, you start incrementally layering this pile. You do so in about 10 inch layers and you're moistening those layers as you move on. So you wanna get the hose out and soak these leaves down initially. I also, to enhance this process, will be adding soil 
in the initial process when this was first layered. So that just means taking a shovel full of soil every second or third layer or so and just broadcasting it over the pile. You don't need a lot of it and there's billions of bacteria in that soil that will then intermingle with the nitrogen in the leaves when they're fresh and all this carbon material that will then help break down this material over time. Now if I just left this pile on its own and just had them put the leaves here, let it go for a year and a half or something, I would have typically a pile of dry leaves a year and a half from now. People are surprised by that sometimes when they end up with a dry pile of leaves and there's really nothing to use. Now it can be used as mulch really well um, and that's a, a secondary use that we'll talk about in a little bit. But if you don't wet the pile initially and keep it moist throughout the process, you'll tend to end up with a dry pile of leaves and you'll slow down the decomposition process. So when the leaves arrive, I have them dump them in a separate pile. I create a space that I can put this hog wire around here so it contains the leaves and they don't blow all over the place. And what I'll do is take the, the hand wand on the hose and spray down the layers so they're totally soaked. Then I broadcast some soil put another layer in, soak it down, etc. A little bit tedious in the beginning, but then I just leave that pile for a year and a half. And what happens during that process is really interesting. At first, since I put a little bit of soil in there, I've added a lot of bacteria, and leaves, if they're just wet on their own, will typically break down with mycelium, not bacteria. Leaves are a pretty carbon uh, heavy material. It's about a 60 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio on leaves, which is why you don't put them directly into your soil because it's too much carbon at once. You can leave them on the surface, they're fine as a mulch, but we need to break down some of this carbon to make it a more usable resource for garden vegetables. So mycelium typ typically takes care of that, and so that beneficial fungus that works on lignin and this carbon material breaks down the leaves on its own. And that takes typically a year and a half to two years uh, if you just use that, that method. That will create a fungal dominant material uh, that is all this leaf material broken down. It'll have less nitrogen and micronutrients in it than the way we're processing it here. And we'll talk about the difference now. So what I do once I have that pile soaked and the soil is in there and the bacteria is then energized with all this moisture and air and carbon and nitrogen in the fresh leaves and they start just propagating and exploding in populations. They heat up this whole pile. So in late fall when this pile was six feet tall and I soaked it down, it got to about 100 degrees in the pile, ambient temperature inside the pile, and stayed there pretty evenly all winter long, under the snows, etc. And that is the bacteria being energized by all, by all that fresh leaf material that has a little bit of nitrogen in there when it's fresh. And that activity created this big heat generating pile here. And the key there is it was really wet. And then the snow helped re-moisturize that pile through the winter, kept that heat, and the importance of that heat is that I then added about 10,000 worms to the piles, and those worms then help secondarily break down all that material and process it into worm castings. So what I've done there by that process of entering bacteria, supercharging the bacteria, heating up the pile, and then adding thousands of worms, is I create the benefit of three different leaf products that I can use on the gardens. Now I've always got the dry surface material that's broken up quite a bit, mostly decomposed but not quite all the way there yet. That's great mulch. So I've got mulch to add to the gardens to reduce soil temperatures, reduce evaporative loss, and keep that soil protected so the soil food web, all the microbiology in the soil itself, can flourish. Okay, and that's important to keep that heat down, especially with climate change, etc. It's a really good heat protective layer to have mulch in between your rows or in between the plants themselves so your beds stay cool. I did an experiment on the channel last month where I compared exposed beds uh, in the sun in the summer here in southwest Colorado 
to beds that had just a little bit of mulch, leaf mulch just like this added to it, and also the green manure in the way that I teach the biointensive methods, which is intensive plant spacing that creates a green canopy over the entire bed, outcompetes the weeds, and keeps the soil cool. So that's the third uh, way to mulch a bed is using living mulch or green mulch. So comparing the three, the dry soil, the mulch soil, and the green mulch, there was a 38 degree Fahrenheit differential between the uncovered soil and the green mulch soil. I think it was about 75 degrees in the bed that was fully uh, covered with its own living mulch. The mulch layer was about 90 degrees. The ambient temperature that day was 85. And the exposed soil that had nothing on it was 111 degrees on the top inch of soil. So that shows you uh, that that environment that that plant is growing in with 111 degree surface temperature isn't conducive to a thriving plant. So you want to at least cover your beds with mulch and leaf mulch is the best free material to use for that. So sorry I got sidetracked there but it's all about this leaf material. So what we've done by heating up that pile is provided a protected environment for the entire winter. If you live in cold regions, this is fine to do under the snow because once it gets to a temperature of say 90 to 100 degrees, if that leaf material is wet and already heated up with all that bacteria, it's gonna pretty much stay there all winter, which it did. So those worms were quite happy. The 100 degree center where it was a little bit too hot, they would avoid that. And they just migrate around to their sweet spots of temperature. And as they're grazing through the different layers of this pile, they're breaking down the wet leaf material into worm castings, which are an, a value added material because there are going to be higher densities of micronutrients and minerals in that worm casting material. They're adding uh, enzymes that create glues to create aggregate soil in your gardens. And that aggregate soil is gonna hold together better and be able to absorb water and stay in place. Um, the biology of the pile will explode with the microorganisms being activated by the worms breaking down material. Um, there's all kinds of benefits there. And then you've got the mycelium breaking down in the, the leaf mold. So that's the third process and that one is a little slower process but it creates humus. When you let the mycelium break down leaves and create humus, that material will stay for decades in your soil. It's a really wonderful baseline for all garden soils. So again, you're increasing the populations of, of mycelium and fungus in that process as well when you add that back into the garden. Now what I have here, this pile's about 20 feet uh, as is the other one, plus the shredded leaves over here, and they were six feet tall to begin with. But eventually, by next spring, as this keeps breaking down, I'll have roughly between 80 and 100 wheelbarrow loads of this material, uh, mostly of worm castings and leaf mold. So those two things break down to the point where they're like black grape nuts. And the benefits for the garden are so amazing when you add that to the spring gardens. And that typically times out really nicely if you start this on one fall, late fall, say October, November, set the pile, let it get hot, let it soak down, then add the worms, let them do their business, and the leaf mold being created by the mycelium at the same time. So all that's happening for the first winter then you come in and check in the spring to make sure if you don't have spring rains re-soaking the pile. You want to make sure and monitor that pile to allow it to be percolating moisture. So typically when the spring rains come or the snows, it'll percolate through that top dry layer, soak the layers below it, and that upper layer will dry out and that's fine. You just kind of peel that away on occasion, check on your pile, and make sure it's really wet below that. And that wetness should go down deep into that pile. If you find dry areas, you want to try to re-moisten those with their hose, and you can take it around or just put an oscillating sprinkler on it for several hours. Whatever you want to do, but just soak that down. Rains and snow here, typically in Colorado, do the trick for us. Um, so I don't typically have to come and re-wet this pile very often. Um, and this happens every year, and in the spring, which is a year and a half after the first pile was set, you will have all this great material. I'll add this to 22 beds, and the reaction in the plant life there, uh, it just creates fertility that leads to growth like this, and like this, and like this. 
And this happens every year. I'll have alternating piles of leaves at some place on the property that I can kind of tap into at any point in time, year after year. So it's nice to dedicate a piece of land somewhere where you know you can leave these piles for at least a year and a half, and then oscillate that with new leaves coming in the following fall, etc. So it's just this great free resource. I can't believe I get it for free because it's incredibly beneficial for growing food. And we really shouldn't be letting this stuff go to waste or filling landfill space with it, which is just crazy. And during that year and a half, while this pile is doing its magic and breaking down and the worms are doing their work and the mycelium is doing their work, it's all happening while you're doing other things, which is great. And that's why I call it passive fertility or backup fertility, because it's there when you need it a year and a half later in the spring, but you don't have to come and interact with it very much. So it's a wonderful way to save labor, save money. This is a free resource. And by the time it's finished, it's worth hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, if you had to buy this much worm casting material uh, or soil conditioner or fertilizer or all the benefits that this stuff eventually does for your garden soil. So you're taking a free resource and enhancing its value over time, but it doesn't require much labor on your part. And so that year and a half uh, episode is really the right timing for me because the, the leaves come in in the fall typically, that's when the arborists want to dump them. I let them go for a year and a half. And then in the spring, when I really need to enrich that soil and start spring planting, this pile and that pile and that pile are all going to be ready. So year and a half is about the sweet spot for me because it times out just perfectly. So let's take a look at what's happening and how the worms have helped augment this process and add value to it. Now you'll see all of these individual nuggets here. These are all worm castings, each one of those. So there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of these castings in this pile already. And there's some egg casings, so you can see the worms are repopulating, and they've all finished this material, turned it into jet fuel for your garden, and they've moved to lower uh, layers. And so as you dig through here, you can collect this material, and there's a few pine needles in there and whatnot, but this is what the worms will do to leaves and they will turn it into this amazing material for your garden. It's like black grape nuts. So this is the first benefit and that's going to create a lot more nutrient density in this material and not just the mineral content. There's not an overabundance of nitrogen in this, but there's micronutrients and minerals and enzymes and the worms benefit this material by adding their glues to the, the castings. All these things are happening passively in this leaf pile. It's a wonderful thing to try. Now the worms are still in here. They're still working at lower layers and they're working their way towards the ground. If given enough time and the pile stayed wet, these leaves would continually get broken down layer upon layer as the worms go deeper into the pile. So that is just the most amazing material. Let me bring that up to the camera real briefly so you can see that. That is just the most amazing amendment you can put in your soil for growing food at home. As you dig down further, you'll find matted layers in the full leaves, but as long as they're wet, it doesn't matter. The worms will go in there layer upon layer and break that down. This is typically used in the spring and fall. Um, again, the lighter dry mulch for sure in the fall. I'll cover all my beds with extra leaves for the fall before the snows happen. And that layer of mulch helps protect those beds for the winter. And once the snows hit, creates a nice insulative layer so that you can still keep things moving on the soil food web level and protect that soil from drying out and further compaction and all that negative stuff. Now there's a really interesting thing about adding this material to soil. If you have a garden that gets constant introductions of really good, mature, nitrogen-rich compost, say from your worm bin, uh, where all your kitchen scraps go and all the vegetable matter, or a traditional compost pile that produces really rich organic compost. Over the years, what you've been doing is you're feeding your plants a really good nitrogen source, but you're also enhancing weed growth 
because that system eventually becomes bacterial dominant, which is typical for annual vegetables, as opposed to a fungal dominant soil, which would be more in a forest ecosystem. So trees and forests grow in a fungal dominant soil, and annual vegetables grow in typically bacterial dominant soils. This particular material coming out is a mix of, of the two, but it's lower in the super nitrogen that you would find in really good compost. So what we're doing here is helping reintroduce populations of fungal diversity into your soil because of the mycelium that's breaking down this carbon material. And I'm also enhancing that with the worms to create more dynamic mic micronutrient density in that material than just raw leaves. So the mixture of the two creates this nice balance to reintroduce diversity of microorganisms into the soil and enhance the fungal balance of that soil. Now what happens there is if you try to get, instead of say a, a high ratio of bacteria to fungal in your, in your uh, garden and you try to get that closer to a one-to-one -one ratio where you bring up the fungal populations, that helps reduce weeds. And that's because of the way fungus produces nitrogen food for plants and the way that bacteria breaks down nitrogen for plants. So we're trying to rebalance that fungal density in the soil to become closer to a one-to-one -one ratio with your bacteria in the soil. Not quite one-to-one. -one. You want the, the fungal base, the fungal populations to be a little bit below the bacterial populations. So it's not quite one-to-one. -one. But the reason being that once you get that closer to balance, you're reducing the number of weeds that want to grow in that soil which reduces your labor. So that's what we're doing on top of all these other things, is introducing the fungal diversity of species back into the soil so that it doesn't become so bacterial dominant. And that comes from mycelium breaking down this carbon material quite a bit and thriving on this leaf mulch material that turns into leaf mold. So try that at home. Um, what you can do first is this fall or late summer, contact your local arborists and find out which one is looking for a place to deliver leaves, to dump leaves, because typically in many places they have to pay to dump those leaves. And we shouldn't throw them away. And if you don't have deciduous leaves in your yard that you can collect yourself, you might as well use theirs. And one other thing that this avoids is bringing on other things onto your property that may have negative attributes, i.e. herbicide carryover, which happens in many manures. Um, so this will sidestep that because most people don't spray herbicides high up in their deciduous trees. It just doesn't happen very much. So this is mycelium, fungal activity, this white lacy material that's breaking down and making leaf mold. So that creates humus over time, and that'll stay for decades in your soil, which is wonderful, because it'll create a very stable carbon-based humus that feeds all kinds of microorganisms, and it stabilizes in your soil, reduces runoff, does all kinds of other positive things. So the mycelium itself is activated in this leaf pile all winter long. You scrape off that top layer, of dry material that typically just stays dry, that turns into regular mulch, and then you dig down for the good stuff that's right down in here. So that's where you're gonna find your gold. Then we'll transfer that by the wheelbarrow load to the garden, work that into the top six inches of the soil, and the plants couldn't get happier. They'll just love this stuff. So that's my tip for the day. Pile some leaves, treat it properly, keep it moist, you don't need to cover it. Let the rain and the snow hit it. And as it heats up, because you inoculated it with soil, just broadcasting a few shovelfuls of soil on each layer or every few layers and letting it get soaked and then allowing the heat to get up to temperature and protected before the winter freezes hit, at which point then you can go get some red wriggler worms um, and put anywhere depending on the size of your pile. Say if you had a six to ten foot pile, I might put two to four thousand worms in there. I put more than ten thousand, I think, in these piles and just let them go. And what they'll do is they will graze back and forth on layers and you'll see those domed layers as you dig down. You'll see all these big layers of ten inch thick 
um, worm castings. So you can just simply harvest those as you go and add those during the year if you need them. Um, but it'll continue processing for a year and a half. It's going to go th through this winter as well, and the worms will just continue. They're happy as can be in there. But that's how we use leaves here. That's how you help close the loop on the garden so that you rely less on purchased uh, additions and amendments for the soil. So make contact with an arborist. Go find your supplier. Dedicate a space on your land where you can leave a pile of leaves for a year and a half that doesn't get in the way and try it on your own. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. That was incredible. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing that with us. And make sure you guys go check him out at growfoodwell.com and see some of the other fantastic things that he has going on. And for us, fall is rapidly approaching yep. and I've got all kinds of ideas because we already beg our neighbors and our friends for um, their leaves, right? And they're so happy to get rid of them. So this year, we're going to start collecting and do some fabulous things with them. Now for the question of the day. What kinds of things are you doing to increase the fertility in your soil? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.